Now, each of the four people I'm talking about in these Kistemacher lectures are identified with one particular book, actually with many books, but one book I think stands out above almost all the others in each of their cases. With Erasmus, of course, it was the 1516 first ever critical edition of the Greek New Testament. Although Erasmus wrote many, many, many other books, that's the book I think that we identify with him and rightly so because of its world historical significance. Now, Calvin, that's not a hard thing. Uh, it's the Institutes of the Christian Religion, though he too wrote many, many other books and shouldn't be just reduced to that one. But we can't think of Calvin apart from the Institutes. I'll be saying something about him tomorrow. William Tyndale translated the Bible into English for the first time from the Greek and Hebrew texts. Now, Martin Luther, I'm going to talk about him today in terms of one particular book that's had a momentous impact on the history of the church from his day right to ours, and that was Luther's lectures on Romans. So this is about Luther, but it's also about Luther and Romans, especially those early lectures on Romans. He went on to say and write a lot of other things that in some ways give us a fuller picture, but we're going to look at Luther today really in the white heat of his early Reformation development. And that's a good lesson for us to keep in mind because the Reformation didn't just happen, boom, out of nowhere or quickly or suddenly. It was a process of learning and growing and deepening in the Word of God for Luther himself and for those who followed him. So, Luther at the lectern, is what I'm saying. Luther as a lecturer, as a teacher, primarily, uh, in his first lectures on Romans. In the first volume of his vast history of dogma, Ara von Harnack described the writings of St. Paul as the conscience of the church and declared that the critical epochs in the development of Christian doctrine could be explained as a series of Pauline reactions. This is Harnock. One might write a history of dogma, he said, as a history of the Pauline reactions in the church, and in doing so would touch on all of the great turning points of the history. Marcion, after the Apostolic Fathers, Irenaeus, Clement, and Origen, after the Apologists, Augustine, after the fathers of the Greek church, the great reformers of the Middle Ages, uh, Luther, after the scholastics, Jansenism, after the Council of Trent. Everywhere it has been Paul in these men who produced the Reformation. Paulinism has proved to be a ferment in the history of dogma, a basis it has never been. Now, Harnock wrote those words, of course, before yet another Pauline reaction had set in. This one brought about by one of Harnock's own students, Karl Barth, who discovered what he called a strange new world within the Bible, a theocentric revolution following a century and a half of neo-Protestant efforts to smooth over the rough edges of Paul's radical notions about sin, grace, faith, election, and judgment. The fact that Harnock himself saw only a ferment, not a basis, in this recurrent Paulinism throughout the history of the church perhaps says more about Harnock than it does about the writings of the Apostle Paul. It reflects Harnock's own captivity to the historicizing and relativizing, indeed what we might call the de-dogmatizing, of the Christian faith, an impetus stemming from Schleimacher's elevation of religious self-consciousness rather than divine self-revelation as the starting point for theological reflection. There is very little of Paul in Harnock's book in German, Das Wesen des Christentum, The Essence of Christianity, the sort of landmark book of Protestant liberalism published in the year 1900. Very little Paul in there. It's not surprising, of course, that Martin Luther should rank among the foremost exponents of a Pauline renaissance in Christian theology. 
or indeed that his name should forever be linked with Paul's letter to the Romans as a pivotal intersection in that doctrinal trajectory. Following his courageous stand at Worms and his productive solitude in the Wartburg, Luther prepared for publication the first edition of his translation of the New Testament in German, which appeared in 1522, in September of that year. In addition to writing a general introduction of the entire New Testament, Luther also produced separate prefaces to the individual books of the New Testament he had translated. In his preface to the epistle of St. Paul to the Romans, Luther said this, This epistle is really the chief part of the New Testament and is truly the purest gospel. It is worthy not only that every Christian should know it word for word by heart, but also that he should occupy himself with it every day as the daily bread of the soul. We can never read it or ponder over it too much, for the more we deal with it, the more precious it becomes and the better it tastes. Sounds like a man in love with Romans, doesn't it? This was not hyperbole. Luther's high estimation of Romans had been hard won through his own intense struggle with the issues Paul raises in that great epistle. Issues that had pursued Luther in his torturous quest to find a gracious God. It was in fact Luther's succinct summary of Romans in 1522, in that preface I quoted from, that was to become so well known and to have such a great influence on figures from William Tyndale and John Wesley to Spurgeon and Robert Murray McShane and many others. Luther's famous preface was a manifesto of Reformation theology, reflecting as it does the Reformer's mature thought at the end of the indulgence controversy and his final break with Rome. However, Luther's decisive grappling with Paul and Romans had taken place some seven years earlier in a series of lectures he had given on Romans at Wittenberg. For nearly 400 years, these Romans lectures of Luther's were lost to history. Their rediscovery in the early 20th century was a major event in Reformation studies in church history, comparable, I would say, to the discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls in biblical studies. Though I shall come back to the Romans preface several times in this essay, I want to focus on this earlier and the much longer lectures on Romans of 1515-1516 before the indulgence controversy, before the 95 Theses, and certainly before Luther's expulsion from the Church of Rome. We shall examine first... The very interesting, at least I find it interesting, the first mystery of the missing manuscript. What happened to those lectures? And then how Luther approached his task as a teacher of Holy Scripture, the sources and traditions from which he worked, and finally, how the Romans lectures fit into his developing theology as a reformer of the church. Those three things I want to do in this lecture. So the first, the mystery of the missing manuscript. Almost from the time of his entrance into the Augustinian monastery at Erfurt in 1505, thunderstorm, all that, Luther had been recognized as a promising teacher, both within his order, the Augustinian order, and in the larger university setting. Early on, he had lectured on Aristotle's ethics, and in 1509, the year Calvin was born, he was appointed sententiarius, which made him eligible to lecture on the first two books of Peter Lombard's Books of Sentences. This was the standard medieval textbook in theology. 
Apart from his trip to Rome in 1510, it is hard to pinpoint Luther's chronology during those early years. But we know from his later testimony that he was deeply concerned, perhaps obsessed would be a better word, with the holiness and justice of God, with the sacrament of penance, and his own desperate inadequacy to obtain salvific solace from it, with issues of predestination and grace, all reinforced by bouts of dread and fear, the famous Anfechtungen I talked about today. So that, he said, even the rustling of a dry leaf would bring on the torments of hell. In talking about this rustling of a dry leaf, Luther has in mind a verse from the Old Testament, Leviticus 26, 36. And he'll return to this image of the wind-blown leaf tossed hither and yon in his lectures on the Romans. In the course of his spiritual depressions, Johann von Staupitz, his superior and confessor and mentor, his father in God, directed him to proceed to complete the requirements for his doctorate in theology. So on October the 18th, 1512, the degree was solemnly conferred. He was appointed for life lecturer in Biblia, that was his title, at the University of Wittenberg, succeeding Staupitz himself, who had had that same, we would probably say, chair. In the winter of 1512, Luther began preparation for his first course of biblical lectures in Wittenberg, the Dictata Super Salterium which he actually presented over the course of the next two years. So Luther began teaching as an Old Testament professor. And most of his lecturing he did at Wittenberg was on the Old Testament. And once he had taken, finished the, the, the Psalms, he takes up Paul's letter to the Romans, which he pursued for three semesters beginning at Easter in 1515 and concluding in early September 1516. This constituted 90 class hours in all as Luther followed a sequence of going through the book in chunks chapter by chapter. After Romans, he continued his academic lectures in Paul, first with Galatians, then Hebrews, and then Hebrews was considered Pauline. Then after his long exegetical sojourn in Paul, he goes back to the Psalms. And we have a second commentary of Luther on the Psalms, 1518, 19, called the Operationis in Psalmos. Why did Luther never publish his lectures on Romans? I think there are at least two possible reasons for this. The first is that it's quite likely Luther never regarded his lectures on Romans as a definitive public exposition of the Pauline epistle. In a letter of December 16th, 1515, he refers to his first Psalms lectures as trifles, quite worthy of being destroyed. While he never made any comparable statement about the Romans commentary, as far as I know, even after he became a reformer, Luther was usually reticent about promoting his published writings. The one notable exception was his larger commentary on Galatians from 1535, which he referred to, remember, so endearingly as my Katie von Bora, was his wife. When Luther first lectured on Romans, his reformational theology was still fluid. So if you read the lectures on Romans and you think you're going to find there a kind of mature, all the strings tied together into a nice bow sort of view of Luther, you will be disappointed. His theology is still in movement. He's still working through ideas and concepts. Later on, he was happy for his followers to learn their Reformation theology from his Galatians, his big Galatians book, or from his two catechisms, published in the late 1520s, or the Augsburg Confession, which of course becomes the singular confessional standard for all Lutherans after the Reformation. Not from the early 
exegetical writings of the young Luther. But there is a more practical reason why I think the Romans lectures were never published during Luther's lifetime. And that is because in 1518, a young, brilliant scholar was brought to Wittenberg by Luther from Tübingen to lecture precisely on Greek and the New Testament. His name, Philip Melanchthon. Romans was assigned to Melanchthon. And he offered at least five lecture courses on it during his long tenure as Luther's beloved associate and successor. As Luther gravitated more and more to the Old Testament, it was Melanchthon who stepped up to take over the New Testament teaching. However, Romans continued to have a formative influence on Luther's theology and preaching, as we've seen already from the praise he lavished upon it in the preface to his Romans translation of 1522. There are also more than 30 extant sermons of Luther from various texts in Romans. And a major portion of Luther's Der Servo Arbitrio, his treatise against Erasmus of 1525, The Bondage of the Will, especially part six, is a reworking of certain predestinarian arguments he first put forth in the lecture on the Romans. Now to the mystery of the missing manuscript. The fact that Luther's Romans was not read for some 400 years is the result of what uh, a fine British Reformation scholar, James Atkinson, has called the freaks of historical accident. At, after his death in 1546, Luther died that year, the manuscript of his Romans lectures passed into the possession of his son, Dr. Paul Luther, who was a court physician to the elector of Saxony. In 1582, perhaps at Paul's bequest, the document was bound in red leather and stamped in gold with the electoral coat of arms. In 1587, the theologian John Vigand referred to Luther's early writings and said, I have held his own autographs in my hands and looked at them with admiration. Later historians were aware of the Romans' manuscript, but assumed that it had been lost for good. But in fact, Luther's grandchildren, Paul's sons, had sold all of their grandfather's manuscripts and books to Joachim Frederick, the Margrave of Brandenburg, in the year 1594. This entire library, including Romans itself, was later incorporated into the Royal Library in Berlin. In this way, Luther's lectures on Romans was consigned to the anonymity of the archives. The oldest catalog of this library, which comes from 1688, lists Luther's Romans manuscript. It's again referred to in 1846, but it's like those books that are... Over there in your library, I'm sure you have some here at RTS, we certainly do, that have been there for generations and nobody ever checks them out. Nobody even knows they're there. In 1905, the librarian noted to his surprise that no Luther scholar had ever come to study this original work of the Reformer. Meanwhile, now the story gets a little more interesting, down in Rome... A copy of this very manuscript had indeed been discovered in the Vatican Library. Not the original autograph, but a copy of it. And in fact, it had been used extensively in the hostile researches of the Dominican scholar and Luther iconoclast Heinrich Denifle. In his attack against the Reformation called Luther and Lutheranism, published in 1904, Denifle cited the Romans lectures as evidence of Luther's ignorance and misinterpretation of the medieval Catholic tradition. Well, this puts Protestant scholars on the search to find the original autograph of the copy Denifle had found in the Vatican Library. 
The story of this copy is itself fascinating. The copy, in fact, had been made by Johannes Alrefaber, one of the scribes who had taken down a lot of Luther's table talk. It had been bought by Ulrich Fugger, a later descendant of the great German banking house who had been involved in the original indulgence controversy. He, in turn, had bequeathed this copy of Romans to the Palatine Library at Heidelberg. Then, during the Thirty Years' War, it fell into the hands of the Catholic sovereign of Bavaria, Maximilian I, who presented it along with the rest of his library, of which it was a part, to Pope Gregory XV. Thus, it had made its way from the Neckar to the Tiber. In 1899, Pope Leo XIII opened the Vatican libraries to the scholarly world, and Denifley, the Dominican, hound of heresy that he was, discovered this long-lost copy and made it the centerpiece of his polemical attack against Luther and the Reformation. Meanwhile, on the Protestant side, Johannes Ficker, a paleographer and historian from Strasbourg, renewed his efforts to locate the Luther original. This finally led him to the Royal Library in Berlin, where the true treasure had lain hidden in the archives all these many, many years. Ficker hurriedly published a critical edition of his great find in 1908. It was still 30 years later, in 1938, when Ficker brought out the definitive critical edition of Luther's lectures on the Romans. And you can find it today. I'm sure RTS Library has the whole Weimar Ausgabe. You'll find it there as volume 56 in the critical edition of Luther's works. The discovery and publication of these long-lost lectures inaugurated a whole new era in Reformation scholarship. We cannot begin to unravel the threads of this vast literature because I do want to tell you something about what's in the lectures. But we should do well here to note in passing three interrelated questions to which numerous scholars have looked again to the Romans manuscript for answers. Let me just mention these problems, then we'll get into the, the lectures. First one. Is Luther and the Reformation in general to be understood as essentially medieval or modern? It's a big debate about that. It's a great debate, for example, between Ernst Trelch and Karl Hall in Germany in the early 20th century. Trelch argued that Luther belonged far more to the ethos, the mindset of the preceding Middle Ages than to the ensuing era of modernity. The real cultural and theological break, Trelch believed, came not in the 16th century with the Reformation, but in the 18th century with the Enlightenment. By contrast, Karl Hall who was at the center of what we call the Luther Renaissance in Germany, believed that Luther had provided the basis for the Protestant transformation of Christian culture by establishing a basis for moral and religious union with God. This became kind of the basis for the old-fashioned Protestant liberalism identified with people like Ritual and Harnock himself. Okay, that's one question. The second question is related to the first. Was Luther the first liberal or the last conservative? Hegel described Luther as a figure of epical significance, the all-illuminating sun which follows the daybreak at the end of the Middle Ages. And this image came to dominate the heroic view of Luther as the champion of freedom and conscience the lonely liberator of the human spirit. To a great extent, this is the view of Luther that remains today, sometimes in both mainline liberal Protestant modalities and too often in conservative evangelical ones as well. 
And finally, the third question that this Romans lectures, I think, helps illuminate. Was the young Luther a precocious Protestant or a constructive Catholic? This issue has become entwined with another debate, and that is when did Luther's great breakthrough into the doctrine of justification by faith alone really happen? And here you've got people who dated as early as 1511, 1512, and as late as 1519, all throughout most of that whole decade. Well, the lectures on Romans are a major battleground for people who care about issues like that and argue and put forth differing uh, schools of interpretation. Now, let me go to the second part of this lecture and talk about Luther at the lectern. We'll make this quick, but I want you to see Luther as he actually was giving these lectures. We know that Luther's lectures took place on Monday and Friday at 6 o'clock in the morning. When do you all start classes here? As far as we know, they were the very first university lectures on the Bible delivered in the German tongue. Because, of course, Latin was the language everybody spoke and learned and which all learned discourse took place. But these were in German. John Oldekop of Hildesheim, who later became a bitter enemy of Luther registered at the University of Wittenberg just as Luther began his course on Romans at Easter in 1515. The students liked to hear him for no one like him had been heard there who translated so boldly every Latin word. Another student from the same time has given us this portrait of Luther at the lectern. He was a man of middle stature with a voice which combined sharpness and softness. It was soft in tone, sharp in the enunciation of syllables, words, and sentences. He spoke neither too quickly nor too slowly, but at an even pace, without hesitation, very clearly, and in such fitting order that each part flowed naturally out of what went before. His lectures never contained anything that was not pithy or relevant. And to say something about the spirit of the man, if even the fiercest enemy of the gospel had been among his hearers, they would have confessed from the force of what they heard that they had witnessed not a man but a spirit. For he could not teach such amazing things from himself, but only from the source of some good or evil Spirit. I think it was difficult to be so inspiring at 6 o'clock in the morning, even in 1515. But what exactly were the students hearing from Luther? Already in his first lectures on the Psalms, Luther had developed a style of lecturing that he continued to use with Romans. He had asked the local printer in Wittenberg, a man named Johann Grunenberg, to print the Vulgate text of Romans onto a special sheet of paper with broad margins and a full centimeter between the lines. The text of Romans was also printed in this way. It took up 28 sheets with 14 lines to each page. Luther was following here the medieval exegetical tradition of glossing the text writing in small, meticulous hand his own marginal comments in this special edition of the text prepared by Grunenberg. But, and here's what's interesting, not only did Luther have that format before him, but so did his students. The students were provided with an identical copy of the text and copied down word for word Luther's carefully dictated comments. We know this from several copies of Luther's students' notes that have survived and were discovered by Johannes Ficker and are included in the critical edition of the Commentary on Romans. And Luther would cite the various sources from the medieval tradition 
the commentators that were well known to everyone in the, in the, in the scholastic system. But even in his glosses on the text, Luther displayed a remarkable freedom in dealing with these sources. He didn't just repeat what they said. He interacted with them and did not hesitate to criticize them. You see this especially in a text like Romans 1.17 where Luther criticizes Nicholas of Lyra's interpretation of the righteousness of God in that famous text. Well, as for Erasmus, Luther was appreciative of what he had done. Uh, but there's also a growing disdain on the part of Luther for Erasmus and for his ability to grasp the gravity of sin and the true dilemma of the human before God. And so he wrote in a letter, No one is a wise Christian just because he knows Greek and Hebrew. Well, um, it was in the course of these lectures that Luther came to discover the doctrine of justification by faith. Now, whether he had all the bows tied together in a neat knot by the time he finished those lectures or not is still a highly debatable topic. My own belief is that it was only after the indulgence controversy that Luther really came to understand justification in terms of the imputation of Christ's alien righteousness. But this again was not an insight that came to him as a bolt out of the blue. It was prepared for over a long period of thinking, writing, reading, and exegeting the scriptures. So let me turn now... Uh, in the remaining minutes we have, to talk about Romans and the shape of Reformation theology. Near the end of his life, that is in 1545, he died the next year, 1546, Luther looked back on his early work as a biblical theologian and the difficulty he had had in understanding that text I mentioned a moment ago, Romans 117, for in the gospel the righteousness of God is revealed... And he famously said, I hated the expression, the righteousness of God. For through the tradition and practice of all the doctors, I've been taught to understand it philosophically as the so-called formal or active righteousness through which God is just and punishes sinners and the unjust. I could not love the righteous God, the God who punishes. I hated Him. I pondered incessantly day and night until I gave heed to the context of the words. For in the gospel is the righteousness of God revealed. As it is written, the just shall live by faith. Then I began to understand the righteousness of God as a righteousness by which a just man lives as by a gift of God. That means by faith. I realized that it was to be understood in this way. The righteousness of God is revealed through the gospel, namely the so-called passive, not active, passive righteousness that we receive through which God justifies us by faith through grace and mercy. Once I got this, I felt the gates of paradise had opened and I had entered in. The context of this autobiographical reflection makes clear that this decisive shift occurred when Luther began his second exposition on the Psalms, that is the 1518-1519 version. However, many Reformation scholars, finding already an evangelical understanding of the gospel in Luther's earlier writings, including Romans, have laid this, date, this late dating to an old man's faulty memory. And so you get this division between the young Luther and the mature Luther, between Luther the Augustinian monk and Luther the Protestant reformer. Could it be, however, that we should distinguish two separate experiences of Luther? One, an initial evangelical awakening prompted by the counsels of Johann von Staupitz 
who encouraged Luther to look to the wounds of Jesus in the midst of all of his torment and struggle to find a gracious God, Staupitz said, look to the wounds of Jesus. And Luther later said, Staupitz has started the doctrine. I owe him my soul. That's one experience, perhaps, which we could date, not be precise, but I'd say 1513, 1514 maybe. The other a theological discovery that led to a clear and different understanding of justification from after the indulgence controversy, 1518 or 19, before the great treatises of 1520. If this interpretation is correct, it's highly debatable, but it's the theory I'm working with, then Luther's theology in Romans will be transitional. Redolent of Reformation motifs, yet reflective of a mind and a theology in process. And this is indeed what we should expect from Luther's own testimony. I did not learn my theology all at once, he later remarked, but I followed where my temptations led me. It is not reading or writing, but not speculating that makes one a theologian. Nay, rather, it is living, dying, and being damned that makes one a theologian. One of the great, great statements of Martin Luther. So let's look at some of these motifs that come out of Luther's struggles with this issue in his lectures on the Romans, what the students were hearing that 6 o'clock classroom. And so I want to deal, I can't deal with everything, but I want to at least touch on, uh, I think I have time for three of these, at least to mention. First, the concept of sin. There's a great deal about sin in Romans, and Luther devotes many pages of his lectures to unpacking this neuralgic theme of medieval theology. The very beginning, chapter 1, Luther says in words that echo Jeremiah chapter 1, the chief purpose of this letter is to break down, to pluck up, to destroy all wisdom and righteousness of the flesh. This includes all works which in the eyes of people, even in our own eyes, may be great works. No matter whether these works are done with a sincere heart and mind, this letter is to affirm and state and magnify sin. No matter how much someone insists that it does not exist, or that it was believed not to exist. How is it that Paul seeks to magnify sin, to establish sin in Romans? Luther's reading of the human situation allowed, disallowed the kind of watered-down, attenuated doctrine of original sin that had come to prevail in the nominalist soteriology of the late Middle Ages which basically, following on Anselm, had taught original sin to be the mere absence of original righteousness. Original sin is privation. It is deprivation. It is the lack of a right standing before God. Now, this is a serious offense, right? But it's something, according to the medieval sacramental system that could be assuaged, corrected through the sacrament of baptism which provided an initial healing which then had to be supplemented and enhanced through the penitential Eucharistic channels of sacramental grace. But for Luther, this schema was totally inadequate. Original sin is not merely the privation of quality in the will Indeed, not merely the loss of light in the intellect or the strength in the memory, but in a word, the loss of all uprightness and power of all of our faculties of soul and body, inner and outer. Over and beyond this, there is a proneness to evil, a loathing of the good, a disdain for light and wisdom. So Luther describes human beings affected by original sin in, in this famous Latin phrase, in curvatus in se, curved in upon themselves. 
Due to original sin, our nature is so curved in upon itself at the deepest levels that it not only bends the best gifts of God toward itself in order to enjoy them and seeks to use God rather than enjoying God, but even more than that, the heart of man is so curved in upon himself that we can never even know this. We can never even be aware of it. Who can discern his errors? Clear thou me from secret hidden faults, Luther says. Now, Luther, of course, did not invent this curvitus image. It's there in Augustine. But he deepens it. He applies it in a way that goes beyond Augustine. He radicalizes the Augustinian notion of sin as amor sui, love of self. And this deepened doctrine of the radicality of sin anticipated by more than three centuries the deepest insights of modernity's two great prophets of atheism, Ludwig Feuerbach and Sigmund Freud. In his commentary on Romans 1.20, Luther anticipated Feuerbach's critique of religion when he observed that the root of all idolatry is human worship of God, not as he is, but as they imagine and think him to be. They think of God as they wish him to be and measure him only in terms of the benefits they receive from him. That's Feuerbach. Religion is the fulfillment of a wish. It's the projection of a father image into the the sky for God. And so religion itself, which is supposed to help and connect us with the divine, becomes in this reading an expression of our very captivity as we project onto God our own wishes and desires. Rather than letting God be God... We turn him into, to quote the title of a recent book, The God Who Looks Like Me. So that's Feuerbach. What about Freud? This verse I quoted from Psalm 1912, Cleanse thou me of hidden faults, secret sins, secret faults. Luther's problem was not ever whether his sins were big ones or little ones. His problem was, has he confessed every one? Is the slate completely clean? If not, how could God be pleased with him? What about the sins he could not even remember? What about the sins committed in his sleep? Luther anticipated Freud by recognizing a depth dimension to the human person and by refusing to limit the effects of sin to the conscious mind alone. Such a radical reading of the human situation could only be answered by an even more radical reading of God's divine grace. So this leads Luther deeper and deeper clearly to understand Justification by faith alone. I'm going to skip this session, section simply because I think you probably know this better than anything else I'm going to say. If not, um, read Luther. But I want to go and, and spend a little while now on the third point in the Romans commentary, and that's humility. Throughout the lectures on Romans, Luther seems very nearly to equate humility and faith. Humility is the predisposition required for the verdict of justification. Therefore, we must keep ourselves humble in all respects as if we were still bare and look for the naked mercy of God that he may reckon us righteous and wise. Now, according to some scholars, Ernst Bietzer comes to mind. It was precisely Luther's break with this kind of humilitas tradition 
that led finally to his mature doctrine of justification by faith alone based on the imputation of Christ's alien righteousness. It would be a mistake, however, to regard Luther's all-pervasive emphasis on humility in Romans as a mere phase through which he was passing en route to a fuller theology. No. While his emphasis on humility was transformed and deepened by his growing awareness of the doctrine of justification and its implications... Humility nonetheless remained a distinctive mark of his spirituality. Luther's emphasis on humility in Romans is informed by his profound encounter with the mystical tradition. True, Luther has some quite negative comments about mysticism in his lectures on Romans. For example, on Romans 5.2 he says, Mystical rapture is not a passageway to God. But as the context shows, Luther refers here to that stream of Dionysian mysticism from Pseudo-Dionysius the Areopagite with its doctrine of inner darkness, its disparagement of the incarnation, and its illicit desire to hear and contemplate only the uncreated word apart from the cross and the scriptures. That kind of mysticism Luther has no truck with, even at this point. However... Just as he was beginning the Romans course, Luther became acquainted with another stream of mysticism, a tradition of mystical theology represented in Germany by the Dominican preacher Johannes Tauler. In fact, Luther published two editions of sermons from the German mystics, one in 1516, the very year he's lecturing on Romans, and another two years later in 1518, the famous Theologia Deutsch, the German theology. We can identify two themes in the lectures on the Romans that recur throughout Luther's lifelong teaching on humility. The first is the theme of self-abandonment. The German word is Gelassenheit. It's a beautiful word. It's hard to translate into English. Gelassenheit. A letting looseness. A letting loose of oneself and of everything else that's connected to the self. So in commenting on Romans 8, Luther quotes the verse of the birds from the Song of Songs 2.5. I am sick with love. And then he comments, We must always take the word love to mean a cross and suffering. Without these, the soul becomes languid and tepid. It ceases to long for Him and does not thirst for Him, the living fountain. Here we see in Romans already the visible roots of an emerging theology of the cross. An emphasis that will become prominent at the Heidelberg Disputation of 1518. In explaining Paul's depiction of the groanings, remember Romans 8? Groanings that mark the life of faith. Luther declares that the soul must suffer and endure God. Gott leiden. Suffer God. Like a field about to be tilled by a farmer, the soul must submit itself to the plow of experience. It must be broken and split open if it is ever to bring forth fruit. Luther will later come back to this image as a pastor in his letters of spiritual counsel and pastoral advice to individuals who have appealed to him for help in times of personal grief and crisis. The ultimate form of self-abandonment, of course, is the willingness to be consigned to eternal damnation, the resignation to hell. This topic emerges in Luther's discussion of predestination in Romans 9 to 11. Here he declares that to be blessed means to seek in God Everything, God's will and glory, to want nothing for oneself, neither here nor in the life to come. One of the marks of divine election is precisely the willingness to resign oneself to eternal damnation, as Christ himself did on the cross. This paradoxical theology underscores the role of humility in the life of faith. 
Since God's electing grace was grounded on His eternal decree, there is no room here for boasting or self-assertion. But Luther recognized that the gift of resignation to hell was dispensed to the elect briefly and sparingly, most often at the hour of death. More commonly, Luther's advice to those who are tormented by the question of election was to thank God for your torments. It was characteristic of the elect, he said, not of the reprobate, to tremble at the hidden counsel of God. Beyond this, he urged a flat refutation of the devil and a contemplation of Christ. In other words, he told those troubled by this question the same thing Staupitz told him. Look to the wounds of Jesus. Luther's lectures on Romans can be read with profit today as an example of one who sought to read Scripture in the company of the whole people of God through the ages. It was never Luther's idea to start a new church, but ever to be a faithful and obedient servant of the one holy Catholic and apostolic church. That the theology which emerged from Luther's Romans eventually led to a decisive break with the Church of Rome remains a part of what Yaroslav Pelikan called in a very, I think, helpful phrase, the tragic necessity of the Reformation. Luther would surely be pleased to know that engagement with the scriptures and especially Paul's letter to the Romans has continued. St. Jerome once said that when he read the letters of the Apostle Paul, he could hear thunder. That same thunder reverberates through all the writings of Luther, but especially, I suggest, his long-hidden but now-discovered lectures on the Romans. And we have to say of Martin Luther what Karl Barth said, What else was Luther than a teacher of the Christian church whom one can hardly celebrate in any other way but to listen to him? Thank you very much.